But as long as we say to ourselves, we will do as we please. The same thing, it falls into our moral structure. The morality of the people is falling, and falling seriously. Good morning, everybody. I hope all is well. I hope people are adhering to their principles and spreading this information out to as many as they can. Today, I'm going to be coming with another presentation, and I don't like to fluff around, so let's go ahead and jump into it. What is behaviorism? Controlling the environment to shape you. Now, as always, diving in, I always like to, you know, help remind people that we cannot fall into our emotional part of who we are. We may hear something that feels uncomfortable. We may, you know, hear something that goes against what we believe. You cannot engage this information with your e emotions. You have to be at um logical balanced state in order to take in this in order to take in this information so don't commit a logical fallacy and try to judge this information with your emotions it cannot be done and also i do not have any degrees i do not have any form of professional scholarship from any university or any college on any of these topics and also don't appeal to any form of authority because as we have seen these authority figures can be wrong and have been wrong and then also too most importantly if you start this presentation please watch it in its fullness to take in all the information a lot of people will only watch like the first 10 minutes or the first 15 minutes but it is highly important that you watch the full presentation and also important that you check out the links and the descriptions and don't just believe me because that's the problem with people is they just believe rather than taking in the information and it resonating with you and you validating it yourself and doing your own form of study, doing your own form of, of research. So highly important. And also, too, if this is um, if anyone is studying psychology in, in any university or school, this is not the presentation for you. I'm not coming from, you know, the the institutional form. So we have to ask ourselves, why is it that these things are continually happening? Why is it that when we try to hand people this information, they don't take it in? Why is it that we still see people going along with this propaganda? Why is it that people still aren't willing to use their voice to stand up for their rights, to stand up for freedom and do the right thing? Why is it that people are still ignorant? And hopefully this is what this presentation is going to bring more awareness to as to why is it that these things are continually going on and why is it that nothing really has changed? So some beginning quotes to be ignorant of one's ignorance is the malady of ignorant. Amos Bronson Alcott. Quote number two by George Bernard Shaw, where there is no knowledge, ignorance calls itself science. Where there is no knowledge, ignorance calls itself science. That's what we are seeing today. And my, you know, my favorite quote of all times, there is only one good knowledge and one evil ignorance. And that's what we have seen is just massive forms of, of ignorance, even ignorance from people who think that they know what's going on, people who think that they are 
so-called awake and aware, a lot of these people are still ignorant to the causal factors, to the techniques of mind control, to the uh, techniques of cult, her mentality, to the techniques of collectivism. They are still ignorant to how dialectics play out. They are still ignorant to how natural law is always operating. They are ignorant to objective morality. They are ignorant to consciousness. And the only way that you can get rid of ignorance is with knowledge. So let's look at a topic in psychology. It's called behaviorism. This kind of came into manifestation in the in like the early 1900s. So behaviorism is a school of psychology that takes the objective evidence of behavior, measured response to stimuli, as the concern of his research as the basis of his theory without reference to conscious experience. A school of psychology that takes the objective evidence of behavior, which is the measured response to stimuli, as the concern of his research as the only basis of its theory without reference to conscious experience. So pretty much the main focus in behaviorism is Controlling the environment, controlling the environment to influence, weaken, or control certain behaviors. So to, to understand what I'm going to be discussing, I have to define some terms. So you have stimuli, stimulus, a thing or an event that creates a response within a being or organism. Then you have a response, an excitation of a nerve impulse caused by a change or an event, a physical reaction to a specific stimulus or situation, or it is a re reaction to something. And then you also have condition, a simple form of what they call learning involving the formation, strengthening or weakening of an association between a stimulus and a response. And these are the terms that was largely used in the field of behaviorism. So we have to look at the history of behaviorism. So you would go to the early 1900s. You had Ivan Pavlov. He was a Nobel Prize winner in physiology or medicine. That's just what the Nobel Prize, um, you know, was called. He won it in 1904. And he was studying, or he won this because he was studying the psychic salvations in dogs. And actually, he stumbled across this information by accident. He is the father of classical conditioning. They also call it Pavlovian conditioning or responded conditioning. And he discovered you can condition a neutral stimulus with an uncontrolled stimulus or what they would call a biological stimulus. And he also discovered that, there, that, that you could, I'm sorry, that the brain would pair these two together and training of stimuli leads to a conditional, a conditioned response to a newly conditioned stimulus. So let's watch a short video real quick that's going to explain what he discovered. I'm sorry, the video will be coming after the next slide. Let's go over what, what uh, classical condition is real quick, and then we'll get to the uh, video. Okay, so as you can see in the diagram, you have the food, which is going to create an unconditioned, a un, I'm sorry, it is an unconditioned stimulus because this is a source that we all need. This food is going to create a response to the dog. And what Ivan Pavlov did is he had dogs locked up in a cage. And he noticed over time when it came time to feed, 
that the dogs would start to salivate, you know, like once they saw the food, then well, over time, once they would smell the food, then, you know, over time, once they would see the person coming into the room with the food. So he just started to theorize, you know, like, hey, maybe, you know, maybe I could start to control or condition the dog's reaction or the dog's response. So you have the food being the unconditioned stimulus because this is going to create a biological response within the dog. Same thing with humans, you know, when you're hungry, um, your mouth starts watering, you know, when it's time to eat. That's just a biological response. You can smell the food, you can see the food. It's a biological response, it is unconditioned. That's going to create a response within the being. So you go to step two, before the condition takes place, you want to condition the subject, which would be the dog. You want to condition the dog to react. So you introduce a neutral stimulus. The neutral stimulus would be the whistle. So you could blow the whistle and there would be no response. So he would blow the whistle and there would be no response, no condition response. So what Pavlov discovered is he could pay, um, he would pair the unconditioned stimulus with the neutral stimulus, meaning whenever it came time to feed the dogs, he would blow the whistle. So over time and through repetition, the dog would associate the whistle and food together. And as we can see in diagram, in in a part three of the diagram, that still creates an unconditioned response because the unconditioned stimulus is present. And through this pairing and association, the dog's mind associates the unconditioned stimulus with the neutral stimulus. And I, I think it was like six to eight times, it got to a point to where you could remove the food being the unconditioned stimulus and just blow the whistle, which is now the condition stimulus, and it will create a conditioned response, which would be the salvate, the, the uh, salivation. Because you have conditioned and programmed the dog to associate the two together. So you don't even need the food anymore. You can get the dog to, to create this conditioned response just by blowing the whistle. Behavioral psychologists have come up with new views, not only of animal behavior, but of human nature as well. And these views all concern a process that we take for granted, learning, because we are all truly born to learn. Ironically, one of the most important figures in the study of learning, Ivan Pavlov, wasn't concerned with the subject at all, at least not at first. Pavlov, a noted Russian scientist, won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1904. As this original footage shows, Pavlov was initially interested in digestion and the action of the salivary glands. By diverting the saliva of dogs into test tubes, he could precisely measure if and how much they salivated during digestion. When food was presented, the dog salivated quickly and inherited salivary reflex. But over repeated testings, a strange thing happened. The dog salivated before contact with the food. Just the sight of the food was enough to stimulate their drooling. Then, just seeing the food dish, or even hearing the footsteps of Pavlov or his assistants was enough to trigger this built-in reflex. What was going on to elicit this response? Pavlov decided to find out by systematically varying the stimuli and measuring the dog's reaction. Metronomes, lights, and bells were all used as stimuli, and they all worked as stand-ins for the food. What mattered was not the kind of stimulus that was used, but the fact that it reliably signaled that food was on the way. Pavlov had discovered a fundamental type of learning called classical conditioning. 
An original stimulus elicits an automatic, unlearned response. Both stimulus and response happen naturally. They are unconditioned. Then a second, neutral stimulus that never elicits the unconditioned response by itself is introduced just before the presentation of the original stimulus. or signaling stimulus is presented alone and response occurs as if the original stimulus were still there, we say that conditioning has taken place. The arbitrary neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. The reverse is also true. Pavlov and others studied the extinction over time of such conditioned responses. When the subject learns that the conditioned stimulus no longer signals a desired event, the acquisition process is reversed as the learned connection is gradually weakened. Pavlov's work and the work of those who followed him led to a remarkable conclusion. And that is, any stimulus an organism can perceive is capable of eliciting any reaction the organism is capable of making. This means that virtually any sound, sight, or smell can influence the way our muscles tense or relax, our moods fluctuate, or even the way our attitudes are formed. For instance, if I say, relax, and then do this, you're going to be startled and upset. After five or six pairings of relax, just saying the word relax is going to generate a negative response rather than its usual learned reaction. If you don't know who that gentleman was in the video, you should look up who he is. His name is Philip Zambardo. He's done a lot of experiments on behavior and obedience to authority. And you can learn from those experiments because it just displays the condition that we are seeing. So back to Pavlov. He discovered the conditioning of the of the conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus repeated would decrease over time. That's what he called extinction, meaning the conditioned stimulus would turn back into the neutral stimulus if it wasn't uh, if it wasn't repeated over time. That's why it said in the video that over time the indoctrination would start to decrease and that was always the problem with classical conditioning because if it wasn't repeated you know like over and over then it would start to lose its strength and then he also noted that the order was important when it came to condition meaning you just can't introduce the neutral stimulus first you have to have the unconditioned stimulus being introduced first and then associate the two together you can't just do it with a neutral stimulus it it just doesn't work out. And then he also discovered how the mind compares stimuli, the uh, stimulus with each other. And, and the main problem, like I said, with classical, uh, with classical conditioning was the extinction. But we're going to get into this later. This was the main problem because over time, the association would start to decrease and the control stimulus would revert back into the new back into the neutral stimulus, meaning the control response would just turn back into no response. John B. Watson, he was the poster boy for behaviorism. He took it and kind of made it more popular. He's known for the highly unethical, highly unethical Little Albert experiment. He popularized the behaviorism theory. He discovered how we join things from class Google, you know, condition this relates to that, that relates to this, and all the associations. And then he also discovered what he called generalizations, meaning that we associate things even if it's not the you know, like the main thing. And you're gonna see this in the next video 
and it's going to talk about this, meaning like if we fear something that is, you know, white and fluffy, we, the brain will associate other things that are white and fluffy and can produce the same response. This is what he discovered in the little Albert experiment. He also discovered how we learn from the consequences of our actions in an environment, how we learn from our consequences of our actions in an environment. He later ended up working in advertising, which is funny because, you know, advertising uses a lot of manipulation. It uses a lot of mind control. It uses a lot of, you know, programming, uh, subliminals, just things that people don't understand about their own psyche. In the early part of the 20th century, psychologists John Watson and Rosalie Rayner set out to teach a baby boy called Little Albert to fear white rats using the principle of classical conditioning. This is a film of their work. The film shows several phases of their study. First, as you see here, the investigators demonstrated that prior to conditioning, Little Albert had no fears of any animals, including, of course, white rats. Watson and Rayner then sought to teach Albert to fear white rats through classical conditioning. In the conditioning phase of the study, which was not filmed, the investigators struck a steel bar with a hammer whenever Albert reached for a rat, making a very loud noise that greatly upset and frightened Albert. After six such pairings of the loud noise and the rat, it was believed that the boy had been conditioned to fear white rats. That is, Albert was now expected to react fearfully to white rats, whether the rats were paired with loud noises or not. In this next film sequence, we see Albert interacting with a white rat after the conditioning process. The investigators believed that the child's reaction during this trial demonstrated his newly acquired fear of white rats. Finally, the investigators expected that little Albert's conditioned fear of white rats would generalise to stimuli that were similar in key ways to a white rat. In this film segment, they were trying to demonstrate that the child now also reacted fearfully to similar objects, such as a rabbit, a dog, a furry object, and a white mask worn by Watson himself. Now you see what I mean by the generalizations is little Albert started to associate you know, other things as the white rat and it would start to produce the same physiological responses, fear. So let's look at that study and how it applies to classical conditioning. <clears throat> you have the unconditioned stimulus, which is the bang. You know, because you go behind any 
you know, infant and you start banging pipes, you know, glass together, it's going to create a loud, a, a loud, disharmonious, annoying sound that's going to create a natural response. This is an unconditioned, you know, response within, within little Albert starts crying. You introduce the neutral, the, uh, the uh, neutral stimulus, which would be the white rat that doesn't, that doesn't create any form of response. So like in classical condition, you associate the two together. That's why they say it. When little baby Albert was taught to play with the rat, Watson would go behind, you know, her little baby Albert and then bang, loud noise. He said what well, after six times, little baby Albert associated the two together. So you have a controlled stimulus. You had little baby Albert reacting to the rat, which was the, you know, which was the original, which was the original response, reacting to the loud bang. This is a controlled response, because this is not a biological response. Something in the environment invoked this response, and through repetition, through repetition, created this controlled response within little baby Albert. Let us, let's look at some quotes by John B. Watson, because I think these quotes can kind of sum up how this individual thought is up. It is up to you to determine, you know, what kind of person this was. But I would say he was probably a materialist, possibly an atheist. He was obviously a moral relativist and wasn't anyone who I would want around my children or, or this is anyone who should have been teaching children because a lot of these techniques have been put in indoctrination camps. The behaviorist cannot find consciousness in the test tube of his science. The behaviorist cannot find consciousness in the test tube of his science. This dogma, the soul, has been present in human psychology from the earliest antiquity. No one has ever touched the soul or, or has seen one in a test tube or has in any way come into any relationship with it as he has with other objects of his daily experience. Now, doesn't this sound like a materialist to you? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Psychology as the behaviors views it, is purely objective exper experimental branch of a natural science which needs introspection as little as do sciences of chemistry and physics. The position is taken here that the behavior of man and the behavior of animals must be considered in the same plane. Denying shadow work, denying introspection, equating human behavior on the same plane as animal behavior. And this is Watson's most famous quote. This gained a lot of notoriety for him and controversy for him. Give me a dozen healthy infants, well informed, in my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist. I might select a doctor, a lawyer, an artist, a merchant, a chef, and yes, even a beggar man and a thief, regardless of his talents, penchants, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors. Let's look at another individual, Edward Thorndike. He was a known eugenicist, known eugenicist. He came up with instrumental learning. And how he did this is he locked cats up in cages. And these little cages had traps and stuff. And then the cats would have to navigate in order to figure a way out. And mind you, just the mentality of these people of doing these experiments on animals shows you know, like what they was deeply involved in because a lot of these people saw human beings just as animals. 
which is why they e use experiments on animals and then equated these same experiments to their fellow brothers and sisters. So you had these cages that he would put, you know, cats in, he lock them up with all kinds of traps. And from this experiment, he coined what he called laws, which aren't really laws. He had the law of exercise, which was broken down into two categories, use and disuse. The use was what exercises the connection with stimuli and response association is strengthened between them, meaning the more and more, you know, you would do this association, then the more and more it would become strengthened, just as disuse connects between the stimuli and response is weakened if not used. That's what the extinction was, you know, all about in classical condition. Then he had the law of trial and error. The subject will try multiple steps if the result is not desired or reach. I mean, hell, mind you, you have a cat trapped in a cage. Of course you're going to try to get out. If you're locked up in a cage, are you not going to try to get out? So you're going to try the same steps over and over. And if it doesn't work out, then, you know, through repetition, okay, this doesn't work out. Try something new. He had the law of recency. The most recent response has a higher chance of recurring, meaning if the cat just tried a behavior to get out, he's going to try that same behavior. He had the law of effects. If an association is followed by what he deemed as a pleasurable, you know, a pleasurable response, it will be strengthened. And if the association is followed by what he called annoyance, it is weakened. This is key here. This is important to understand right here. And then he also coined many other what he called laws. But we all know man cannot make law because law is something that is set in stone. And here is a quote by Thorndike. Psychology is the science of the intellects, characters, and behaviors of animals, including man. Once again, a quote association, uh, a quote that is associating animals with man. So I ask you the question, who is the most notable psychologist of the 20th century? I'll give you a hint. It's not Carl Jung. It is not Sigmund Freud. It is not Jean Piagetti. And this is taken from a list of psychologists. A hundred most notable psychologists of the 20th century. We have number one, B.F. Skinner. Which Skinner's work is not very popularly known by most people. And there's a reason for that. B.F. Skinner spent 50 years in behaviorism. 50 years. He transformed the field of behaviorism. He was influenced by Watson and Thorndike. Most of his work was done on rats and penguins in what he termed Skinner boxes. He discovered the learning process has a very, or, well, no, I shouldn't say he discovered, he claimed the learning process has a very predictable response to reward and punishment. He showed how consequences to responses influence future behavior or negated certain behavior. He showed how consequences to responses influence future behaviors or negated certain behaviors. And then also he saw free will as an illusion. He created what we know as operant conditioning, which is still used in schools today. And operant conditioning uses reinforcements and punishments. Reinforcements strengthen a behavior, punishments weaken a behavior. And then he broke these two classes down. You have positive, meaning you are adding something. So you can have a positive reinforcement or you can have a positive punishment, meaning you are adding a stimulus to the environment. 
And then you have a negative or, or what he termed negative reinforcement. And you have a negative punishment. When it's negative, meaning you were taking something away, you are subtracting. And I'm going to go over all of this because this can be kind of confusing, but I think if you just just slow it down and take in the information and you check the links in the description, all this can be understood. And remember, this is used to train animals, train children in these public indoctrination camps. This is used to train people in the corporate world. This is used to train people in the military and the police because all they do is follow orders because this is all this is about. This is not about education. This is about indoctrination. This is about training. This is about force feeding their ideas into the mind. So we have a diagram of what operant conditioning is. I used this in my last presentation. You have a behavior that you want to influence in a subject. You identify this behavior. Most effective is attempting to weaken, also identify replacement behavior and reinforce when it occurs. Determine what the subject values, likes, and dislikes. What the subject must associate the consequences with the behavior. So you have a behavior. If you want to weaken this behavior, you have what he termed punishment. You have punishment in the form of positive punishment, something that is not um, you know, happening that the subject does not want to happen. So you have a positive punishment, meaning you add something. Then you have the negative punishment. You subtract something. So a positive punishment would be um, you know how you have a dog, your dog keeps running out of the yard. You want to negate this behavior of running out of the yard. It's a positive punishment. So you introduce something. That's why it has you add it. You add a stimulus. So you could add like a shock collar. You, you know, there's an electric fence. So in order to weaken this behavior, the dog running out of the yard, you introduce a stimulus being the dog collar and through repetition reinforcement. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Through 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 a repetition of the shocking, then that's how you have this positive punishment because you want to weaken this behavior. Another form of a or what he would call, you know, positive punishment. If you have a child who's cursing. You want to weaken this behavior. You introduce something into the environment. Um, what, you know, like what people would do back in the older days, you know, pop the child in the mouth, which I'm not a fan of because it's violence. Um, you're introducing a stimulus. Because you want to weaken this behavior, which would be cursing. So you, you introduce something. That's why it's positive. Don't look as positive as right are negative as wrong. This is just the terms that he used. Whenever it's positive punishment or, or a positive reinforcement, something is being added. Something is being introduced as a stimulus to get you to react. So you have a negative punishment. A negative punishment is something the subject does, likes, or values, and wants to keep that you take away. So a negative punishment would be like a threat because you know that the subject wants to engage in this behavior. So you threaten them to say, hey, if you do not do this, then I will take this away. Because once again, you want to weaken this behavior. So you're saying, if you, do, if you don't stop doing this, then I'm going to take away something that you like. Because you're taking away something, you are subtracting something because you want to weaken the behavior. So let's look at what the reinforcements are. Reinforcements are behaviors that you want to strengthen, behaviors that you want to associate to, you know, to have a higher probability of happening over and over again. So let's look at what a positive reinforcement would be. Because you want the subject to increase the probability to increase this behavior so you reward them that's what a positive reinforcement is is you reward it because you're adding something let's say with a, a let's say with a, a dog 
You add treats. You add food. This is how they train dogs, you know. You don't give the dog the treat. Well, every time you may give the dog a treat, like maybe one out of five, hell, one out of six, or one out of ten times. And then through hell, repetition, through this positive reinforcement, the dog will associate the treat with that behavior as one and the same. So then you also have the negative reinforcement. A negative reinforcement would be if you know the subject does not want to engage in a particular activity. So you say, hey, if you do this, then you don't have to do that. Like when a, when a parent tells their child, like, hey, if you don't want to have to do your chores, get good grades. That is what a negative reinforcement is because you know the child does not want to have to do chores. So you're saying you're adding something. You're adding saying, hey, if you do this, then you don't have to do this. To get them to influence one behavior by pretty much, um, you know, taking away something that you know that they don't want to do. A negative reinforcement can be kind of tricky to understand. I'm going to try to think of another example. Here's what a negative reinforcement would be. Hey, if you get the jab, you do not have to wear masks. That's what a negative reinforcement would be. Because once again, you were taking away something, which would be the mask, something that you know that people don't want to do. So it's annoyance. But you want to influence this behavior. You want to influence the behavior of going out and getting the jab. So you tell the people, say, hey, if you go get the jab, then you don't have to wear a mask. That's what a negative reinforcement would be, which we all know that was a fucking lie. Can pigeons read? This one gives every indication because he's been taught to distinguish between two words and to behave appropriately. He's learned his different response to each sign by being rewarded with food. So the bird isn't acting independently. Its behavior is shaped by controlling its environment. The first task was to isolate an individual piece of behavior and see how that could be changed. Skinner did this by keeping individual pigeons at about three quarters of their normal weight, so that the birds were always hungry and food could be used as an automatic reward. The pigeon was studied in a uniform box, one it quickly grew used to. One piece of behavior, pecking a colored disc, was measured on a graph. Pigeon learned that pecking the disc produced a reward. Then the behavior of pecking could be studied in relation to how often that reward was offered. Or in Skinner's terms, what was the schedule of reinforcement? The main thing is what's what we call schedules of reinforcement. Reinforcement is what the layman calls reward, and you can schedule it uh, so that a reward occurs every now and then when a pigeon does something. We usually use a response with a pigeon pecking a little disc, a little a spot in the wall, and you can reinforce with food. But you don't reinforce every time. You every perhaps every tenth time, or perhaps only once every minute, or something like that. There are a very large number of, of schedules, and they have their uh, uh, special effects. And there is a good example of how you can move from uh, the uh, the pigeon to the human case because one of the one of the schedules which is very effective with, with rats or pigeons is what we call a variable ratio schedule and that is at the heart of all gambling devices and has the same effect the pigeon can become a pathological gambler just as a person can now the the fact that we found that out with pigeons and could prove it by removing and changing the schedule makes it easy for 
court to interpret the case with, with, with human, the human subject. We, we don't say that the, the human subject uh, gambles to punish himself, as the Freudians might say, or gambles because he feels excited when he does so. Nothing of, nothing of the sort. People gamble because of the schedule of the reinforcement that follows. And this is true of all gambling systems. They all have variable ratios built into them. So what we've learned from the pigeon, it made it possible to interpret this vast field very effectively. Where does that leave free will? Because we all think we have a choice of whether to do things or not to do things. Yes. Well, you see, we, we leaves it in the position of, of a fiction. We, we have uh, assumed somehow or other that these internal states, feelings, and so on, have initiated something. They have started something. They have created. We, 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 we have done something in, vo in a voluntary way. We have will to act. If you now look at the actual history, we find that there are external reasons why this has happened. In other words, by discovering the causes of behavior, we, we can dispose of the imagined internal cause. We dispose of free will as a, an American divine of the 18th century, Jonathan Edwards, did. He said, we believe in free will because we know about our behavior, but not about its causes. And of course, it's, a sci it's, it's the, the object of a science of behavior to discover causes. And once you have found those causes, there is less you need to attribute to an internal act of will, and eventually I think you need to attribute nothing to it. We dispose of free will. Wow. Wow. Just shows the mentality of these people. And isn't that what the social engineers have always wanted, you know, to do? To eliminate the free will within you know, within man, the possibility. This is what behaviorism was all about. And this is what we are seeing now. So, Skinner broke down um, the reinforcements into primary reinforcements or biological stimuli, things like food, water, you know, shelter. These are like just biological things that we all need. And then he also um, broke it down into secondary reinforcements. And these had power because they were associated with the primary reinforcements, things like money, because you need money in order to get the food, in order to get the water, in order to get the things that we need to survive. And then he also had a term called shaping. Shaping is what is used to break down behaviors into smaller groups and reward them with positive reinforcements to learn complex behaviors. That's why in the video, you saw the pigeon kind of doing a 360. Well, yeah, because you can shape it and through a repetition and reinforcement, you can get the pigeon to mold its behavior based on, you know, you reward it. So you have a pigeon, you, you want to train it to do a 360, you know, turn around in a 360, a 360 degree. You can put food toward the left, you know, do that, you know, help a few times. If the pigeon starts to associate the two, then you can put the food behind it. So it's doing a 180. And then, you know, you can put it toward the right. So it's doing, you know, pretty much a, a full circle. And by way of shaping it through the reward and reinforcement and repetition, you can get it to do a full 360. This is what he means by shaping. You know, you're using these behaviors and, break, and breaking them down into smaller groups and you're rewarding them to get them to, to achieve and do complex behaviors. This is what is used in the circuses. You know, we are seeing these, or where you see these elephants or these other animals doing these, you know, like very complex tasks. Well, how do you think they get it done? It is through B.F. Skinner's, um, you know, operant conditioning and through shaping and through punishment and through reinforcements. This is what training is all about. This is the whole point of behaviorism is is getting certain behaviors influenced and decreasing certain behaviors that the social engineers do not want. And then he also had chaining when you reinforce a combination of learned behaviors, you know, together. This is also what is used in the whole circus enslavement. You know, you just chain these behaviors together and then you reinforcement and you use reinforcement and repetition to associate all of these behaviors together. And yes, you know, mind you, it does take some time to get an animal or a being to 
be shaped. But once it's done, once it's done, because remember, they are just tapping into the dopamine response, you know, the whole brain reward pathway with these means of reinforcement. They are tapping into our animalistic, uh, you know, dopamine limbic part because the dopamine is created or it is, you know, pushed out through the VTA, the ventral tegmental area part of the of the limbic system. And, you know, that's connected with other parts, the hippocampus, um, the thalamus, the um, amygdala, prefrontal cortex, you know, it's going to send this reaction through other parts of the brain, but it is in this dopamine, you know, you know, this dopamine response we can get fixated on because the point of, you know, the whole point of this is, is for motivation. You know, like without this dopamine, we would not have any means to motivate ourselves. But the problem is, is when you manipulate that, and that's what they are doing is they have manipulated people with these reinforcements to fall into these means of association to these stimuli and response, stimuli, her response, stimuli, eat her response, which is programming people to act like animals, because that's exactly how animals act like, you know, the whole stimulus response mechanism. But there's no mention of higher consciousness. There's no mention of, you know, creativity, of logic. That's what they have done, is they have tapped into people's animalistic, base, unrational aspects of who they are. And that's what her operant condition has done. And I'm not saying that, you know, these means are bad. These same means can be used for good. It's just the social engineers are using these means, you know, to indoctrinate people, to enslave people. And the only way they are able to do this is because people are ignorant of this information. They are so ignorant of it. Most people don't even know who B.F. Skinner is. They don't even know what classical condition is. They don't know what opera conditioning is. They don't know what the, you know, the main four techniques of, of cult indoctrination are. So, uh, so hell, one last time, let's look at what opera condition is. You have a, a reinforcement which strengthens a, a behavior. And then you have a punishment which weakens a behavior. So a positive Reinforcement, a stimulus is added a, a stimulus is added after a behavior to increase a behavior, like a food, a treat. You have a negative reinforcement, removal or avoidance of an adversive you know, behavior to increase a wanted behavior, promise of something if you stopped something. It's just like how I use the, the analogy of the parent who wants their kid to get good grades. So they'll say, hey, if you get good grades, you won't have to wash the dishes for the rest of the month. Or if you get good grades, you won't have to do chores, you know, because you want to influence the behavior of getting good grades. So you introduce something. Then you have the opposite punishment. The punishment is to weaken, you know, behaviors. The positive punishment, a stimulus is added after a behavior to decrease a, uh, a, a behavior. I use the analogy of the dog and the shot collar. So let's look at another example of what a positive punishment would be. Um, if you want to go and get groceries, you have to show papers saying that you are jabbed. That's what a positive punishment would be in terms of operant, you know, condition, because once again, you are introducing something, a stimulus. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That is, uh, that is a negative punishment. Okay. Sorry. Wrong analogy. A positive punishment would be if you, um, if you want to go out in public, and not social distance, then you have to show papers. That's what a positive punishment would be because you're introducing a stimulus, you know, the whole showing papers, and you know that people want to go out and, um, you know, associate and not have to social distance because people don't want to have to help isolate themselves and distance themselves from, you know, you know, from loved ones. So in order to 
um, increase, I'm sorry, in order to decrease that behavior, you were introducing something, which would be, you know, you know, wanting people to go out and get vaccinated, wanting people to go out and get jabbed in order to decrease, you know, certain, um, a certain behavior that they don't want to engage in because they know that people want to go out and be around loved ones and be around friends and not have to, you know, follow the whole fake social distancing crap. And then you have the negative punishment. Removal or threat of a pleasurable stimulus to decrease the likelihood of a behavior. The threat of taking away an Xbox if the kid gets bad grades again um, are, once again, I use the analogy of a negative punishment would be if you don't go and get jabbed and show your papers, then you will not be able to go to the store. You will not be able to go and associate with friends because, once again, you know that people want to go out and engage in these behaviors. But in order to weaken, you know, you know, these behaviors, you you use means of threats. So real world applications, you know, let's let's apply this to the real world, because it's one thing to just it's one thing to just know hell about these things, but you have to apply it to the real world. So let's look at some of the real world applications of reinforcements that we have seen in the past two years. You have the positive reinforcements. You know, they were offering people food if you went and got jabbed. Donuts, you know, hamburgers. They was offering, you know, money. All these free benefits because, remember, you want to increase behaviors. You want to influence certain behaviors. So you use reinforcements, positive reinforcements. They had lotteries, stimulus checks. You know, the whole stimulus checks because they wanted to increase people's behavior as far as just being lazy and not working. They was giving out free beer if you show proof that you had been jabbed. They was giving out free, free what Uber and Lyft rides. Um, in some states, they was giving out free, you know, free, uh, uh, free weed, free marijuana. And then there was also states that was doing her restaurant discounts. So let's look at some negative reinforcements. If you wear a diaper, you can go in public. Because once again, you're taking away something by saying, if you do this, okay? Because they know that people want to go in public. They know it. They know people want to associate with friends and loved ones. If you get the jab, you don't have to wear the diaper. If you show your papers, you don't have to do this. And once again, they are saying if you do something, influence behavior, then they'll take away something that you don't want to do. Let's look at punishments, real world applications. You had the positive punishment. I remember a positive is you're introducing a stimulus. You had fines. People were going to jail for not wearing diapers. You know, going out, going out. Well, in public, there were people who lost uh, court battles, uh, custody battles, because they did not show their Nazi-style Gestapo totalitarian, you know, papers. The order followers, you know, being more violent on people who want to be free. Then you got the violent cult members who want to attack other people because they want to think outside the box. You had the loss of jobs. How many people have lost their jobs? Bans from stores. N no way to get entry for food. Now remember, positive punishment, you are introducing a stimulus to decrease behaviors. All of these positive punishments have are are trying to inf are trying to influence people not to engage in these behaviors, to get people to follow the narrative, to get people to follow the propaganda, to be an obedient little slave, to be a good little slave. Let's look at some negative punishments. A negative punishment is always going to be a threat. There is always going to be a threat. Threats of job loss, threats of no entry to get food, threats of stealing rights and freedom, Threats to steal social interaction. Threats of seeing loved ones. 
Because yeah, remember, if you do not do this, then you can't do this. We've been threatened so much in the past two years because they use the threats to decrease certain behaviors to condition people to be good little slaves. Now, you can associate opera conditioning, classical conditioning with the four main techniques of cult of cult indoctrination. This is what I'm trying to bring awareness of is you can mix the two together to perform and create and mold a very obedient worker, a very obedient drone. So like I've talked about many times, what are the four main techniques of cult indoctrination? You had isolation. We saw this in the early stages. Stay indoors, stay at home, don't go to work. Installing the propaganda and their narrative, all the censorship and the control of information. So we can't communicate. We can't share all this information. You feel disassociated from everyone. You feel divided from everyone. You feel alone. You feel unworthy. Conformity. All the mainstream media said the same vomit. All the countries said the same shit. The same phrases, the same slogans, use the same fake ass foolish, etc. But remember, it's just two more weeks and we're all in this together. It's going from two weeks to two fucking years. And remember, all of these countries were saying the exact same thing, getting you to conform, 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 conform. Because that's what cults are all about. Conforming, there's no individuality. Do as I say. There's no creativity. You have to conform to what the group says. You have to conform to what the mainstream media says. You have to conform to what the science says. Step number three, repetition. That they've hammered over and over. Repeat the narrative. Repeat the slogans. Repeat the fake footage. Repeat the rewards. Repeat the punishments. And the reinforcements, repeat, repeat, and repeat the idea that the, you know, that this virus is real. Even so many people who claim to be aware and awake still are repeating that this is a real virus. And then you have the last step, trauma and fear. The collective PTSD that we've seen, the fear of death. The fear of ridicule, the fear of abandonment, fear of losing your job, the fear of truth, because people still want to buy into the propaganda, the fear of killing granny. And what about the fear of each other? You know, people don't even want to associate. People don't even want to hug anymore. People don't even want to hold hands. You know, everyone's so worried that they're going to get sick and die. This is all fear. And this creates trauma. And these are all techniques that have been used in cults throughout time and memorial. But once again, because people do not understand how their psyche operates. People do not understand this information. People do not understand how mind control works. So let's look at Pavlov's work, Watson's work, Thorndike's work, Skinner's work, the whole fake COVID, you know, you know, hell narrative and statism, which is the biggest cult in the world. The is the biggest death cult that all the other cults are under the umbrella. So let's look at Pavlov's work. Did it involve isolation? Yes, because once again, the dogs were locked up in a cage, not in their natural environment. Did it involve conformity? Yes, it did, because he got the dogs to conform to his will and not the will of the dog. Did it involve repetition? Absolutely, it did, because that was how he has associated the uncontrolled stimulus with the neutral stimulus through repetition. And I don't have the trauma and fear box check, but you can actually say that locking any animal up in a cage is going to create trauma and fear. I'm just giving Pavlov the benefit of the doubt. 
just so people don't try to say I'm over examining the situation. OK, let's look at Watson's work. Did Watson use isolation? Absolutely. He isolated little baby Albert away in a cultured environment. Little baby Albert was not in his natural environment, folks. Because remember, in order to do an experiment or, or in order to do that experiment, he pulled Albert out of his environment. He he purposely selected Albert out of, you know, like hell, multiple other kids. Did he use conformity? Yes, he did, because he got little baby Albert to conform to the will of Watson by way of association of the rat and the uncontrolled stimulus, which was the bang. And repetition, yes. The video said it only took six, six, uh, six times before little baby Albert associated the two together. And then trauma and fear, yes, because whenever little baby Albert saw that rat, he started crying. He wanted to crawl away. When they even um, put the little white rabbit close to little baby Albert, the same response, same thing with other furry things. Just like in the picture when you saw Watson with the white rabbit mask, what happened to little baby Albert? He started crying. He wanted to run. Uh, he wanted to crawl away. Thorndike, did he use isolation? Yes. He isolated the cats and put them in boxes. That's isolation right there. That's not a natural environment for a cat. You put a cat in any, in any enclosed box, you don't think that's going to create trauma? Conformity. Yes. Hell, once again, getting the subject to conform to the will of whoever is conducting the experiment and repetition. Absolutely. That's how the cats were able, you know, to get out. He'll use repetition and Thorndike would use repetition over and over to figure this stuff out. They didn't just do it once. They didn't just do it twice. These people was doing this stuff for years. And then a the trauma and failure. Hell, like I said, you put any, you, you put any cat, hell, let alone any animal in a cage, especially a cage that enclosed is going to create trauma and fear. It's going to create anxiety. It's going to create nervousness. I mean, just imagine you being locked up in a, a cage that tight. Skinner, isolation, yes. He kept the pigeons isolated because remember it said he, he kept them two-thirds starved so the pigeons were always hungry. Hell, once again, none of these hell, individuals were in their natural environment. You always have to isolate them. Always have to isolate them. That is the most important step is isolation. Skinner got them to conform. Skinner got the pigeons to do what he wanted to do. And repetition. Over and over and over again. Trauma and fear. Yes. Hell, once again, you're starving the pigeons. That, you know, I'm like, that right there, hell is already producing a toxic environment. You know, so you have any animal that's starved, you know, you can pretty much get it to do whatever you want it to do. And of course, you know, you have the whole 2020 slash 2021. Hell, isolation, yes. Conformity, yes. Hell, repetition, yes. Trauma and fear, yes. All of them. And we cannot forget the most deadly, most satanic, the most evil, the most corrupt, the cult that is running all of them. All of them. The cult of authority. You can call it the Saturnian cult. Let's call it the cult of death because it's statism. You know, yes. And I'm including... All the social engineers, all the secret societies, all in the same thing because they use statism to control people. You can, you know, how you can add the royal family in this. Yes, how you can add the Vatican, you can add the Jesuits, you can add all the secret societies. They're all embodied together. And, and, and there wasn't even enough space, enough check marks to even mark off what this death cult that people still worship called statism is. Does it use isolation? Yes. The, the public schools, the universities, conformity, absolutely. The pledge of allegiance, pledge allegiance to the state. You know, do, you know, pay your taxes. Don't think outside the box. And repetition, yes, uses indoctrination techniques over and over and over again.
and of course the trauma is fear. Yes, if you do not do this, they will send their thug goons, these thug order followers to enforce their will and possibly shoot your dog, murder you, murder your wife, and then take your child and you know throw them in their own indoctrination camps. So again, we have to use applied knowledge here. You have to apply knowledge. Why is this knowledge and information important? If we don't know how our mind operates, what chances do we stand against the social engineers who know all about the human psyche? This is what people have to ask themselves. Like, if we don't understand these techniques of mind control, then aren't we always open to these subject, uh, you know, like freaking open to these hell mechanisms of mind control? This information has to be understood. It must be understood in order for us to pull ourselves out of this. It has to be understood. We have to learn the knowledge and apply the knowledge and teach it to other people. You think these people out here protesting know how mind control works? No. You think they know the main uh, four uh, techniques of cults? Do you think they know about classical condition? Do you think they know about opera condition? Do you think they know about B.F. Skinner's work? No. They don't because if they did, they wouldn't be out there protesting. They would be creating content to try to educate people. Or at least if they were there, they would be trying to, hey, like, hey, guys, you know, do you understand how this works? You know, you know, do you understand how your psyche operates? Do you understand how the laws of nature operate? No. And this is not to be larry for people. This is to bring awareness so we can really create some change. Because once again, we have to change he here and here first, in the mind and in the heart first. People that are trying to go straight to the the action first. Well, good luck with that. That's not how the shit works here. These social engineers know this. Why do you think they target people's minds? Why do you think they constantly have the propaganda machine running 24-7 to put out the information? Because you control the people's minds first, then you control the way they feel, then you control the way they behave and act. And how do they do that? By controlling and shaping the environment. So this picture right here, this is an accurate picture because this is your mind. This is your mind. It has been shaped. It has been molded by the government and by the social engineers. This is your child's mind. This is your wife's mind. This is your friend's mind because it's all being shaped. And if you know this stuff, then I'm not talking hell about you but the people who are ignorant of this their minds are still being shaped their minds are still being cultured because what is culture what is what is the etymology of the word culture to plant a seed agriculture you're planting a seed that's what the word culture means at its etymological roots you're planting a seed There is a difference between mind control and mind influence. That's why this information needs to be learned. Because you can use the same information to deprogram yourself. You can use the same information to empower yourself. If people knew this information, then when they are going and talking to these, you know, ignorant folks, then you can, you know, you know, it's like rather than dive into the information, how about dive into the techniques that they're using to manipulate people? You have a higher chance at influencing people that way than just going to the hardcore stuff. Understand the techniques first. Understand the, the mechanisms and how things operate first. So what is mind control? It's based on fear. It limits the imagination and the human potential. It retards our problem-solving ability. It is based on subjective indoctrination. It limits it limits the information. There's hardcore and softcore mind control. It is cult mentality, collectivism, and groupthink. Mind control is based on ignorance, and the end game goal is to enslave. Well, let's look at mind influence. Mind, mind influence is based on agape, 
meaning true love, the highest form of love. Because that is about expansion, expansion of the imagination, expansion of the human potential, expansion of our reason, expansion of our logical you know, have capacities, expansion of our ability to solve problems, and expansion of our awareness. And the only way to to come to this is an understanding of the self, an understanding of who you are, and an understanding of how the natural laws work. Expanding your awareness into objective morality. Mind influence enhances our problem solving skills, our problem solving abilities, because it's based on objective knowledge. It is based on the aggregate amount of information, not just coming from one source, not just coming from the mainstream media. An aggregate of knowledge. You're constantly updating your framework. You're constantly taking in information. It helps educate the individual. Real education, because real education from its proper etymological a definition means to lift up or draw forth the potential within. Real objective knowledge. And the purpose of my influence, when it's used properly, is to free and expand the mind. So some closing quotes before I wrap this up. Albert Einstein, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. No problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. Meaning, can we just stay at the same level of thinking in order for us to solve this situation that we're going through? No, we have to elevate our awareness, elevate our consciousness in order to understand this. Last quote by Amin Rahani. Ignorance, ignorance and fear are the twins whose mother is slavery and whose father is oppression. And the mentality of the whole family is that of slaves. Ignorance and fear are the twins whose mother is slavery and whose father is oppression. And the mentality of the whole family is that of slaves. Well, is that not what we have seen? People in fear, people in ignorance. And what is that creating? A full-blown slave planet. If people stop blaming the ones who are at the top, you know, everyone's pointing fingers at Bill Gates. Everyone's pointing fingers at George Soros. And mind you, are these people evil? Yes, they're evil. Yes, they deserve some blame, but they are not the ones who are actually doing what is happening. It is your own family members. It is your own children. It is your own friends. It is your own neighbors who are still pushing this agenda. It is the average individual because they are in ignorance and fear. Put the blame on the ones who are actually going out and doing the harm, who are doing the violence, who are stealing people's rights, who are taking away people's freedom. Those are the ones who we should really be blaming and help. Like I said, I'm not saying don't blame the ones who are, who are at the top. But at some point, we have to take responsibility and look at who who is really doing the most harm, because the ones at the top, they are just whispering in people's ear. You know, they are just paying people off. They're not really doing. They're not really taking action. It is the ones who are actually going out and manifesting these behaviors on other people, using coercion, using violence. You are raping people at a spiritual level, at, at a spiritual level by violating someone's free will. Because every wrongdoing that we can ever possibly do violates another's free will. If you would like to dive deeper into these topics, like what is a real right 
and what is wrong, you know, like what real objective morality is, what real freedom is, what real anarchy is, how we can free ourselves and raise our consciousness, please check out the One Great Work Network. So I thank everyone for tuning in. I hope there is something learned. And as always, please check the links in the description. And everything that I said, there's nothing new to what I've talked about. There's nothing new to any of this. It's just we have to get in the right mindset to use our voice to put out the uh, the information to, to combat this 24-7 propaganda machine and become knowledge become knowledgeable of who we are, become knowledgeable of natural law, become knowledgeable of what objective morality is because that's the royal way out of the situation, you know, coming to an understanding of natural law and teaching that to other people and putting the information back out so others can take action, so others can learn. So I thank you and have a good day. Peace out.